Hi, everyone. Welcome to our, our tasting table. This is our tasting table in our, one of our two blending rooms here in London. And uh, welcome to our very first Compass Box virtual tasting. Uh, we've done, some of us, I and some of the other uh, members of the team have done several of these over the last couple of months, as you can imagine. But this is the first one we've done ourselves. So it's exciting. I'd like to say happy Father's Day to, uh, I know Father's Day was last weekend, but uh, many of you are joining us because of Father's Day. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was only about five or six weeks ago that we conceived of this idea, you know, thinking, you know, during this, the pandemic, um, you know, we've got to be thinking about doing things differently. It's difficult for all of us to get together. It has been extremely difficult. Um, it's encouraging that things are starting to, to open up. But we thought that, what, what can we do around Father's Day, that being a day when people do traditionally give gifts of, of, of whiskey to fathers? <clears throat> and uh, and we, two of our team members, Pete and Karen, conceived of this idea in a phone call. It's like, well, let's just have John do a, a virtual tasting, and, and we'll let people we'll buy these. You know, we've got these th three-bottle malt whiskey gift packs. People can buy those, and they can sign their fathers up for, for this tasting. And we thought, OK, that'd be great. You know, get 20 or 30 people, 40 people. <clears throat> that'd be fantastic. Over 500 people have signed up from over 30 countries, which I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> and, and I think it's awesome. You know, people talk during these times about how positive things will happen or are happening in this time of the pandemic and all. I think this is an example of that. You know, this is, this is amazing that we can reach so many people all around the world right now to share and enjoy what we love, uh, which is great Scotch whiskey. So welcome all. Um, questions and answers. We encourage you to ask questions tonight. We, are going to we will answer everything, in every question in due course. So I am here in the blending room um, with Alex, young Alex. And um, we are at a safe social distance across a very long tasting table here. Um, and out there in the virtual world, we've got team members. We've got Karen and Pete and Scott who are going to be answering. They're going to be fielding the questions that you send in during the session. There's a little Q&A button you'll see down uh, on the bottom of your screen. Just click on that and send us questions about Compass Box, about Scotch whiskey in general. Um, Karen and, and Pete and Scott will endeavor to answer them in, in real time. They will forward those that they can't uh, to, to us here in, in London. And, uh, and, and, and Alex and I will try to answer as many as we can tonight. And if you don't get your question answered tonight, we're going to give you information at the end. We're going to send you an email tomorrow that we're, with an email address for you to send your question to us after the session. And we will answer every question over the next couple of days. OK. This is going to take about an hour. Um, and to kick it off, I think that Scotch whiskey tastings ought to start with whiskey tasting. So we're going to get into each of these three whiskeys in depth. But right now, we're just going to do a quick hello uh, taste of the first whiskey. All right? You guys all have been sent, hopefully, uh, instructions on how to set up the tasting. Hopefully, you've got three glasses. If you don't, if you just have one, that's fine. Um, but we're going to start with, um, with, with the spice tree. Okay? A quick tasting of the spice tree. Just, I love to give the whiskey a swirl like people do with wine. The whole idea is it, it, it throws off more aroma molecules and it helps you get a better sense of what's in the glass. Better sense of what's in the glass. And so when I swirl and sniff this, you know what it reminds me of? What it, you think, whatever comes to your mind is the right answer, by the way. There are no right or wrong answers. And we all have different associations for aroma and flavor. Um, and, that, and so that's fine. What this re reminds me of right now, actually, is, um, is the chicken that I, 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 I smoke roasted a chicken today at lunch, um, Sunday lunch here in, in, in London. And th there's French oak I'm going to talk about in, in this whiskey that we, we, that we bring in from the Vosges forest. It's heavily toasted French oak. And it's, it has this aroma of spice, like clove spice and sweet associated aromas of other spices. And years ago, we had this French oak chipped, made into small chips. 
And <laughs> I've got bags of it at my house. And we use it for the barbecue. We use it for smoking food. And so I was roast, smoke roasting these chickens today, and I was taking French oak, the kind we use for spice tree, in chips, throwing it on the, onto the coals. And the, the garden smelled like that. It smelled like spice and French, toasted French oak. It's really cool. And it made the chicken taste delicious as well. That's what it reminds me of. So have a little sip, and we'll get going. We're going to start off um, bottle strength, a little sip. But if you'd like to add a little water, if you don't like bottle strength, that's fine. Add a little water. I've got my water here. I've got my little contraption for adding water. But in any case, let's get going. Cheers. You don't have to spit. I spit. It's what we do in the trade. We don't sit around in the, in the blending room all day drinking whiskey and, and having a jolly time. We do have a jolly time, but not because we're, we're drinking whiskey. When we drink and our, uh, taste and assess whiskey here in the blending room, we are um, tasting and spitting. So that's what I'm doing. So pardon me for that. Mm. You get the clove? You get that sort of clove character, the spice character? That's why we call it spice tree. Because of the, and I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Welcome to you all. A lot of you I know are will be fans of, of what we've been doing for a long time. Grateful to have had you along all this time and have you here um, this evening, London time. Um, but I know a lot of you will be totally new to Compass Box. Welcome to you as well. Let me give a little introduction before we get into the detail of the whiskeys about what we, who we are as business, what we do and how we do it. We are a Scotch whiskey maker. Okay, we are a Scotch whiskey maker. Um, we are buying whiskies. We're not distillers, we're, we're blenders. We're buying whiskies from distilleries across Scotland. We buy whiskies that are aged and have been aged for quite a long time from the distiller, from various distilleries. Um, we're buying whiskies that, that are surplus to their requirements. Um, and that's very common in the world of Scotch whiskey. That's been going on for many decades, that the various distilling companies will sell or trade Scotch whiskey stocks back and forth. We're buying aged whiskeys. We're also buying what is called new make whiskey. So that is uh, spirit right off the still from about a half a dozen distilleries every year. We source casks for them. We source casks from around the world, from the United States, from Spain, from France. Um, and we send them to about a half a dozen different distilleries that we'd love to work with and have them fill those casks with new spirit, new make, and we age those for the future. And that's how we obtain the raw materials for what we do. We are blenders. In the, in the, in the old vernacular of our industry, we're a blending house. And um, I wanna, there's, a, there's a great book, which I have here, that every whiskey enthusiast out there, Scotch whiskey enthusiast, ought to have. And it's a book called Whiskey. <laughs> Um, and it's by Anais MacDonald. Um, uh, there's a story about uh, Anais MacDonald and that name, which is for, for another time, but it'll, it's explained in the forward here. This fascinating book, this was written in 1930. This was written in 1930, so almost 100 years ago. And it's a whiskey enthusiast's view of the world of Scotch whiskey at that time. And in it, he talks about, because uh, at that time, you think about the world of Scotch whiskey, the industry as we, we know it today, was still quite relatively young then. And he talks about the blending houses and their importance to, to the trade, to the industry. Um, he, t he points out that blending, okay, blending Scotch whiskey really got going in the 1860s when a, the laws changed in Scotland that allowed whiskey producers and blenders, who at the time would have probably just been blending different single malts, it allowed them to start blending malt whiskies, single malt whiskies with grain whiskies single grain whiskies. Grain whiskies are lighter than malt whiskies. They've been, they've been made for several decades at that point in time, in the 1860s, whereas, of course, malt whiskey has been distilled in Scotland for 500 years. But the laws changed and allowed people to start to blend malt whiskey and grain whiskey. And malt whiskey at that point wasn't very popular. It wasn't a fashionable drink. The, the malt whiskies, the single malts back in those days would have been much different, in, in, in large part, much different from what we taste today. Well, in general, they would have been much more rough and ready and, uh, and, and deeply flavored, and they simply weren't to the taste of, of, of people, even in the urban areas of Scotland at the time. But when they started, when the laws changed and they could blend the lighter grain whiskies to the malt whiskies, what they realized is they had something that was really tasty. And they had something that was much more approachable than the malt whiskies of the day on their own. And that launched the industry as we know it today. 
Yeah? And with that blending houses in cities, as, as Aeneas points out, in cities like Dundee and Aberdeen, the Leith section of Edinburgh, Glasgow, port cities, that all had dozens of blending houses. Yeah? And we today are a blending house, but what we've been doing for the last 20 years since I started the business is we've been taking that traditional old-fashioned model of the Scotch whiskey blending house and updating it for the 21st century, yeah? rejuvenating it, okay? and doing things a little bit differently. Um, that's who, who we are. We are a blending house. We make a range of different Scotch whiskies. You can find on our website. You'll see we make seven whiskies, core whiskies, that we bottle every year. And in addition to that, we do a number of limited editions uh, every year. So we make a range of Scotch whiskies in a variety of styles that really run the spectrum of what Scot which Scotch whiskey Scotland can produce uh, today. We make a range. And at the risk of sounding slightly immodest, um, you know, the, the, our whiskies, the, the, the character and the quality of our whiskies rank amongst those, the, the, the very best single malts produced in Scotland today. And the reason for that is we are making our products, our whiskies, from some of the very best single malts in Scotland. Um, we are a creative business. So to us, blending equals creativity. Blending is about cre creativity. It's not a way of, of making mass quantities of, 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 of mass-produced stuff. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a platform for creativity. There are, there are two, think about two key reasons why we blend. Okay. One is to create a whiskey okay, that is more compelling, we think, more interesting than the individual single malts that might have gone into it or single grain whiskies that might have gone into it. So it's to try to make something more compelling than the individual component parts. And examples of that would be the three whiskies we're going to taste tonight, these three malt whiskies. They're each blends of single malts. And if you were to taste, if you could come into the blending room here someday and taste the individual single malts that go into these recipes, you'd find them delicious. You'd find them very good and interesting. But what we do is we take them and we try to make them into something that's even more compelling through blending. That's one of the reasons we blend. The other, the other key reason we blend is to make styles of whiskey that no single distillery can create. And a really good example of that would be our Artist Blend and Glasgow Blend uh, from our Great King Street range. These are blended Scotch whiskies. These are that, that, that form of Scotch whiskey I was talking about um, earlier, blending single malts with single grain whiskies that started in the 1860s in Scotland, that created this different style of whiskey, which was much more approachable and much more commercially viable than malt whiskeys on their own in those days. Yes, blended Scotch whiskey has this reputation amongst some, although it's changed, been changing over time and getting better. But it does have this reputation for being inferior somehow. And the single malts are the best, and blends are, are, are boring. And part of the reason for that, I contend, is that, yeah, a lot of the blended Scotch whiskey brands out there in the world are kind of boring. A lot of them got really light in the 70s and 80s when there was a, a, a taste and a trend for lighter spirits. And they never, a lot of those brands really never caught up with the times. Doesn't mean, just because it's a blended Scotch whiskey, doesn't mean it's somehow inferior. It's all about the quality of the components and the intent of the maker. And you can make really flavorful, compelling blended Scotch whiskeys, as we endeavor to do with Artist Blend and Glasgow Blend. Anyway, right. So those are the two key reasons we blend, to make something more compelling than the individual components, to create styles of whiskey like our, our blended scotches, Artist Blend and Glasgow Blend, that no single distillery in Scotland can create. It has been 20 years since I started this business. 20 years. And some of you who recognize that I'm speaking with an American accent might wonder, how does that happen? Uh, that an American gets... I, 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 I left university <clears throat> and wanted to be a winemaker. And I followed that path for many years. And... Uh, at the advice of, uh, uh, advice of one of my, uh, my old mentors, one of my greatest mentors, Peter Holt, he suggested I ought to be, I'd be better off on the business side of, of wine uh, rather than making it. And I took that advice, but I never got that job on the business side of wine. I got a job on the business side of Scotch whiskey for, uh, for one of the bigger brands that you might recognize. It's got this dapper dandy with a very large hat who strides across the, the label. They hired me, and they moved me to the, the UK. And, uh, and after several years here, 
um, I decided I was going to start my own Scotch whiskey company. And that was 20 years ago. And some of you will know we make a grain whiskey called Hedonism. This was the first whiskey I created when I started the company 20 years ago. Not a malt whiskey, not a blended scotch. I bottled a grain whiskey. Technically, it's a blended grain whiskey because it's a blend of different single grain whiskeys. Yeah? Delicious vanilla, coconut kind of character. And that, was, that very first bottle looked like this <laughs> 20 years ago. Yeah? The woman's head. The first woman's face on a, on a Scotch whiskey label in the history of the industry, as far as we, we can tell. No one's been able to disprove that in 20 years. She's still on the label today. That was what we did first, 20 years ago. We've come a long way. Um, today, the team is 19. There are 19 of us. We're selling around the world. Um, let's, Alex, can we see a quick picture of, of, our, of our team? There we are. That was us, and uh, we were in Seville in the middle of January. We had a team meeting out there. We try to get together uh, once a year. Uh, four of us are based in the U.S., um, uh, managing sales in the U.S. Celine's up in Edinburgh, and the rest of us are based in and around London here. Um, that's the team. And together, we, 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 we run this company. We exist as a company to make the world of Scotch whiskey a more interesting place. That is why we exist as a business. And in doing so, you know, it is our, our earnest hope that we also can make your lives, or at least your drinking lives, that little bit more interesting. That's what we do as a business. Right. Okay. And with that, let's get down to business, shall we? We're going to go back to Spice Tree. Okay, we're going to go back to Spice Tree and talk about this whiskey in a little more detail. You already know why it's called Spice Tree, because we're aging the malt whiskeys in this, in, in, in this recipe on French oak, which is unusual uh, in Scotch whiskey. Um, French oak that's made for winemakers. It's never been used by winemakers. We bring it over to, to Scotland, and we age malt whiskey in it. And we, we created a, a, a proprietary cask uh, many years ago um, when in, 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 in the creation of Spice Tree. Um, swirl it. Sniff it. I'll come back to the proprietary cask. Adding water to whiskey is a perfectly okay thing to do, right? Perfectly okay to thing to do. You'll find, as you get to know us, if you don't know us that well, that we are very open about the enjoyment of Scotch whiskey because that is really what it is all about. It's about enjoyment. It is about pleasure. And there isn't just one way to, to experience Scotch whiskey, especially with all the different styles of Scotch whiskey, with you know things like you know gr blended Scotch whiskies, which are fantastic, and in, in Scotch whiskey highballs are on the rocks and uh, on, with ice, that is, um, and in cocktails. You get into big malt whiskies, more sort of um, uh, after dinner or, or sort of uh, outdoors kind of, kind of whiskies. There's a whole range of style and occasions for Scotch whiskey, and no rules as far as we're concerned in, in, in enjoying it. But when we're tasting whiskeys like this, adding water, I contend, is really helpful to get to know the whiskey. If you're open to drinking bottle-strength whiskey, I would always suggest start with the whiskey at its natural, at, at its bottle strength, and this is 46% uh, spice tree. And then after you've done that, we've already tasted this one, I'm going to suggest add a little water, and lots of ways to do it. Just take your glass and carefully add a few drops. We have these pipettes we use that allow us to add small amounts of water without the risk of, you know, drowning the whiskey, because what we want to do here in a tasting is, is just add a little splash of water like that, one or two of those, and what's going to happen, then I'll let the whiskey and the water kind of interact and, and, and let a new equilibrium form there. What we're trying to do here is release more aroma compounds, dilute the flavors inherent in that whiskey, and what will happen is it'll, the whiskey will open up. We say it opens up, and we're going to start to pick up through our nose and then on the palate aromas and flavors that we weren't getting initially. Because at high strength, sometimes flavors can kind of get locked into a whiskey. And they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't release um, as readily as when you add some water. Or, you know, over time as you're sitting swirling your glass over the course of 20 minutes or so, you, it might start to open up through slow oxidation. But you can kind of speed that up. And also through, through adding water. And also, frankly, some people prefer whiskey at a slightly lower strength. I mean, let's face facts. You know, 46% alcohol causes pain. 
it causes pain, right? That's a fact. Um, some people enjoy that, and that's fine. Um, but adding water dilutes that and softens the impression on the palate of the whiskey. And for a lot of people, that's a good thing. So let's go back into this now that I've added some water. And I'm getting so much more. I'm getting, um, it's reminding me of um, actually like leather, like polished leather, as well as the spice characters in there. And there's a kind of like a fruit, an exotic fruitiness in there that's being released. And now if, if you've added water, or what, if, even if you haven't, let's go back and taste the spice tree again. I really do think that as Spice Tree opens up with a little water, you get to know that whiskey so much better. There's so much more. It's quite shy in a way. <laughs> it's quite assertive when you first pour it out of the bottle, because all that, that French oak character and the underlying uh, character of the malt whiskeys. But once you open it up, it really um, shows you its softer side and gets really delicious. How do we make this? So. Um, Years ago, so I, I started my working career in the wine business, as I said. And when I got into Scotch whiskey, one of the things I noticed, realized, and this is now the, the mid-90s, is that it, back then in Scotland, the, the people didn't take oak, the, ca the casks, the oak that the casks are made of as seriously as people do in the wine business. Um, it just wasn't, it wasn't, it, they were seen more as vessels than they were as, as flavor enhancers. Um, and I, I, I borrowed some thinking from the world of wine as I got further into the world of whiskey and thinking, you know, what if we were to use the, you know, the, why do the winemakers get all the good oak? What if we started in Scotch whiskey using the quality of oak, the character, the type of oak that great winemakers use? What could, what could happen? So I went to the Vosges Forest on the advice of the late Dr. Jim Swan many years ago. And I went to this cooperage and was blown away and fascinated. They were making some of the most extraordinary um, high-quality wine barrels um, for, you know, for wineries around the world. But they also made flat oak inner staves of the same quality of oak, same you know, trees. They would just, rather than shape them into a barrel, they would, shape, they would just cut them into flat staves. And it was inc becoming increasingly popular around the world with some winemakers to rejuvenate old wine barrels by lining the insides with these oak staves. They hadn't been turned into a, a, a barrel. They were just flat oak staves, toasted like you toast a barrel. And when you toast oak like this, it, it, it kind of caramelizes flavors and compounds inside the wood, and it, and it turns, it gives that oak a lovely, much more delicious flavor than it would be if it was untoasted. And I thought that was fascinating. So we brought some flat oak interstaves back to Scotland, and we, we experimented with them years and years ago. Lined the insides of, of, whis of, of used whiskey barrels, took 10-year-old malt whiskey, put them in these barrels, left them for 6, 9, 12 months, and they were transformed. The flavors that, that that quality of oak gave the whiskey transformed them into something that was intense and uber delicious. And because this French oak had this clove character, we released this whiskey called the Spice Tree years ago. And we were quite proud of it. And we were very open about it. We were, you know, on the, on the forums of the day, um, uh, we, were, we were quite open about the process and the source of the oak. And, and so, sadly, to my mind, the Scotch Whiskey Association um, found out about this, because as I said, we were open about it. And they said, they came to us and said, you know, we know what you're doing, and we just don't believe it's a traditional practice. And by our interpretation of the law, you must make Scotch whiskey by traditional practice. Now, we argued, I argued that, well, okay, I get, I get that and I respect that, but don't traditions evolve? You know, 500 years ago, when, 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 when people started producing malt spirit in Scotland, they weren't aging it in oak at all. So there's been this tradition, this evolution of traditions. And I argue this was one of those. And, and by, we're using some of the highest quality Cooper joke you can buy, and, and that can't be a bad thing, can it? And we lost that argument, long story short. <clears throat> Um, they, didn't, uh, they didn't see it our way, and we couldn't afford back then to, to, to fight it. And we didn't, you know, I'm not, not the kind of person who wants to fight, but I was trying to stand up for what I thought was right. We agreed with them that we would stop using that technique after we'd sold out everything we produced, and then we started thinking. And with the help of Dr. Jim Swan, we created this custom barrel where we took the same French oak we were using for the interstaves, and we, got, we worked with our coopers in Scotland to come up with a way to, to use that oak and line the insides of... Uh, of used whiskey barrel heads. And now we're just putting French oak on the heads of the barrels. Brand new, heavy toasted French oak, beautiful oak. And because there were no internal structures in this with this technique, 
um, we've been allowed to do it, and it allowed us to bring Spice Tree back eventually. That's how it got here. That's how it got here. Formerly illegal. And we use this technique of French oak finishing, we call it. We use whiskeys that are French oak finished in lots of different recipes in our range. And let me take you to the next whiskey because it also uses some French oak finished whiskey in it, but it's, it's not the primary flavor driver. Um, we're going to move on to the story of the Spaniard, but before we do, I want to see if there are any questions, Alex, that have come in about Spice Tree or about Compass Box in general. Um, yeah, actually, uh, Jiggs asks about the French oak. Uh, on a technical question, how it differs compared to other European oaks mm -hmm. that's more commonly used, mm -hmm. but also why we decide to use it for the barrel heads rather than for the whole barrel. Sure, yeah, those are really good questions. So when we're talking about French oak, there's not just one kind of French oak. And, and we, we are buying a specific species, um, Quercus petraea. Um, is the one that we identified with Jim Swan all those years ago that gave the kinds of, when heavy toasted, gave the kinds of flavors that we thought really complemented malt whiskey. Um, so it's, 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 it's about the species, okay? And um, there are certain forests around Europe, around the world, which, for reasons we don't need to get into tonight, um, are more conducive for growing oak that's better for cooperage, okay? And the Vosges forest happens to be one of those areas. And um, so we were, so we're sourcing a very specific variety that gives us, when heavily toasted, those spice aromas um, that, that we love. So that's really what we're, we're looking for in the French oak is, is the variety. We could buy Quercus petraea from a, a, a forest in uh, Hungary, for example, um, that might give us very similar characteristics. Um, but we happen to have good relationships and contacts um, with, uh, in, in the Vosges in France. So We've been using those producers um, for some time now. And the second part of the question, Alex, was? Uh, why we would choose to uh, use it for the heads and not the whole barrel? Why, yeah, that's right. Um, because malt whisk, scotch whiskey would quickly be overwhelmed, or is quickly overwhelmed because we've experimented with it, when you age it in a brand new French choke barrel. At least that's my, my, my point of view. Um, and so just using it on the heads gives us that touch of oak that we think is, is the right balance. Um, the oh, barrique or, or, or French oak cask um, could quickly overwhelm the spirit character. Speaking of casks, we'll move on to Sp the Spaniard now. Move on to the Spaniard. It's the story of the Spaniard. And what is the story of the Spaniard? Let's swirl it and sniff it. And what do you get? What does it remind you of? And yeah, now that you, I guess most of you are at home, and many of you are probably on your own, so you can just say whatever you want or think whatever you want. You don't have to worry about what other people are, are thinking or saying or if my answer, my, what I think is right or wrong. Whatever you think is right. If it reminds you of uh, a sweet that you had as a child, a candy that you had as a child, that's okay. That's fine. We all have different associations uh, in, in many cases for various aromas. I'm smelling things that remind me a little bit of... of like orange citrus, kind of. And I get what I would call, a gen in general, a wine character. A wine character. Go ahead and um, taste it if you're tasting it at bottle, bottle strength, or add your water if you're going to add water. I'm going to taste it at bottle strength and add a splash of water. And now, in the finish, the aftertaste, I'm really picking up the wine. It reminds me of hints of sherry character, sherry wine character, hints of, of, of red fruit, um, kind of red wine character. There's, there's spice from oak is there in there as well. I, when, I, when I taste whiskey, you see I, I aerate it a little bit. That's because I'm, I'm an old wine guy, and that's what you do in the wine business. Some people in whiskey do that, some don't. But the reason I do it is drawing in air and, and aerating in your mouth it just helps to, 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 again, create more surface area on the whiskey and, and generate more throwing off of, of aroma molecules. It just helps me to get more of what's going on in, in, in the whiskey. So, that wine character. It's called the story of the Spaniard because the main flavor driver is malt whiskey aged in former sherry casks, sherry wine casks from Jerez in Spain. 
And that, those kinds of casks, what we call in the industry sherry casks, um, have been, they're traditional casks. They've been used in Scotland for well over 100 years, um, being shipped in from, uh, up from Spain, obviously, sometimes empty, sometimes in the old days filled and, 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 and dumped here when the wine sold off and the, and the cask sold onto the whiskey trade. But it's a traditional type of oak cask for, for aging Scotch whiskey, and it imparts this lovely richness, um, part from the, the oak and part from the wine that has been absorbed into the wood staves of that cask over the years. Um, and it's a lovely complement to, to certain kinds of malt whiskey, and especially big, what we call meaty styles of malt whiskey, um, like the single malt that we used here um, for the core of this recipe. Aged in the, these former sherry casks, Oloroso casks is, is, is what these are in, in this case. But th that's not all. When we made the story of the Spaniard, uh, what was it, 2018, we spent probably the most of 2018 um, working on it for many months. And what we were trying to do is we looked at the whole world of, 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 of commonly available single malt whiskies that are primarily aged in scotch and sherry casks, and we tasted them all blind. You know, no dark glasses, so we couldn't see the color. We tasted them all blind over, over weeks and months, I suppose, and we tried to identify, not knowing what was what, which ones we liked and why. We really tried to understand what it was we liked in this style of scotch whiskey. And then the task for us was how do we make something through blending different single malts and different cask types, predominantly single malts aged in sherry cask, how do we make something that's different? How do we make something that stands out in the crowd? How do we make something that, and this is the, you know, this is something that every whiskey we, we produce has to live up to, how do we make something that's really delicious yeah, in this style? And we worked on it for many, many months. Jill, Elif, um, uh, our head of operations, Jill's our, one of our whiskey makers, James is the other whiskey maker. This is before James joined. We worked on this for months. And what we ended up doing is com using not just single malts aged in former sherry casks, but also malt whiskey aged in former red wine casks, aged its entire life. We also blended in malt whiskies um, that were finished in French oak, like we use for, sp for spice tree. And a portion was uh, malt whiskies aged only in American oak. Okay? only in American oak. Um, so we, we, we created these layers of flavor through drawing on different malt whiskies aged in different kinds of casks to create something that we thought was quite special. A lot, many months of work that went into that. And the story of the Spaniard is called the story of the Spaniard um, because, well, frankly, we couldn't trademark the Spaniard. <laughs> Other brands have, 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 that, have been using that for years. The story of the Spaniard, though, we thought, well, I thought, spoke to the way I first encountered the wines of Jerez, the sherry wines, when I was quite young in my university days, um, when I first traveled to, to, to Spain, to the south of Spain, I was introduced to, to, to sherry wines in one of those little tiny, tiny bars in the far south of Spain. Uh, my friend and I used to call them wine closets. <laughs> and that's where I was introduced to, to Sherry by, you know, some, an elderly gentleman who I didn't understand because I didn't speak Spanish. And, and uh, it stuck with me forever. We never made whiskeys aged in, sh in sh we, we never used Sherry cask aged whiskeys very often in the first many years of the business. Part of that was kind of stylistically what I was trying to do back then, but also it was partly because um, it was hard to get consistency harder back then to get consistency in sherry casks, cask to cask. There's been a lot of um, inconsistencies in sherry casks over the years for various reasons. But now we've got a good line on consistency. Now we've got a great supplier in, in Spain, um, Miguel Martin, um, for the whiskeys that we're filling today and have been filling for years from new make so that we can get consistency of ca cask character over time. Okay. That is the story of the Spaniard. Each batch of this is slightly different. So it's not easy to get hold of all these com of, of red wine aged whiskeys and, and, and some of the, share, the, the beautiful sherry cask aged whiskeys that we want for this style. It takes time and searching. So on the back of the label, you'll see batch numbers. And you can um, look up on the website the details for each of the batches. But consistently, what we're trying to do is create this style that's not just about sherry. It's also got some, some other sort of red fruit character to it. Um, it's also got some spice from French oak. Um, and it's not all wine casks. In 
French oak cask. It's also got American oak aged whiskies in there as well. So we're trying to make something quite special. When you do go on the website, I will just say, we've made three batches of this, okay, uh, since launching it in late 2018. And per forgive us, partly because of the COVID situation, um, we, have, we haven't updated the website with the recipe details for batches two and three. We're going to do that this week, okay? And you can email us and ask for them. We'll send them to you. Um, but we'll keep that up to date as we do subsequent batches of the story of the Spaniard. Questions? Questions, questions. Alex? Uh, yeah. Um, Graham asks, is there a particular reason why the story of the Spaniard is at 43% and not 46%? That's a really good question. <clears throat> we went back and forth on this, Graham. We went back and forth on this. And we tend... I, I, you know, Peat Monster, which we'll taste next. Um, our limited editions, we've never bottled a limited edition malt whiskey less than 46%. I like that intensity of flavor typically in malt whiskeys. Um, but with the Spaniard, the recipe for this, we found that it just showed better out of the bottle at 43% rather than 46 We just thought it showed better. Um, and it's, it's a subjective decision at the end of the day. There are no rules about this. But we just thought if, it's, it, if it just it comes alive, at, more alive at 43% than 46 then let's bottle it at 43 so. Simple as that. See how this opens up with some water. Other questions, Alex? Um, yeah. It seems a lot of people are picking up on the um, oak uh, aspect of it all. Uh, mm -hmm. Andrew asks, when it comes to sherry cask matured whiskies, do you have a preference for American or European oak? Or do you use both? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we tend to use American oak. Um, but um, some of the older whiskies that we're buying, obviously those that we didn't fill, sometimes we, we can't tell, Miguel Martin could tell, we can't tell if they're, they're American oak or, 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 or European oak or Spanish oak, whatever it might be. Um, there's lots of different oaks that they use in the sherry region um, in Spain. But it's mostly American oak that it's used there. And so what we're buying now um, for filling our whiskies and have for the last several years is sherry cask aged whiskies, uh, sherry casks made from American oak. We just like the combination of the flavors of American oak with the sherry character and the tannin levels um, for long term aging like this. Is there another part to that question? Uh, that was the whole part. But um, what else do we Jefferson have? asked if we've ever experimented with any other types of sherry uh, and mm -hmm. have plans to have bottles with malts matured and other types. Sure, sure. Yeah, we, 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 we age whiskies in Palo Cortado casks. Um, and we've also done some, it's not, strictly speaking, it's not sherry, but we've also, we're also doing some, some uh, maturation trials with uh, Vino Duranjo, which is a, a, a orange wine. But it, it's basically a sherry-style wine from the south of Spain that's been um, uh, infused with, with orange peel. And uh, that's quite interesting. Um, we are, we've not started yet Pedro Jimenez trials, but we will start doing that. Um, and yeah, in the next, in the, in the coming years, we will be doing more um, as we, you know, we, 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 we develop our relationship with Miguel Martin. He's got so much to offer. Right. The story of the Spaniard. Again, adding water, now I go back to it, and it just becomes more effusive. It just becomes more effusive. Hmm. Both lovely postprandial after dinner kinds of, of malt whiskies. But I will tell you, through years of experience, certainly with Spice Tree and also increasingly with the story of the Spaniard, that you can make some beautiful, if you're into the whole world of cocktails, you can make some beautiful cocktails, um, stirred down cocktails with, with these, these two malt whiskies. Right. You know what I forgot to tell you about before? Speaking of other ways to enjoy whiskey, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but. I just want to show you this. That's our favorite highball glass. That's our favorite. We're, we're big fans of Scotch whiskey highballs. Did anyone watch Dave Broom um, the other night, last week, when he was doing his commentary for his film, uh, uh, Amber Light? Um, he was with the director, and they were basically talking over the film and, and explaining um, some background of the film. It was fascinating. And they, they, the, for, it was sponsored by Royal Mile Whiskies, and Royal Mile sent out these tasting packs to people. There are five whiskeys in it, and two were ours, thing, which was nice. But um, as they went through the film, Dave was saying, okay, now it's time to open this whiskey, and here's why. 
and uh, when they got to the end, they, he opened up Glasgow blend from, from us, and, and he drank it as a highball. So he, had, and he drank it as an iceless highball, um, and, uh, which is a thing that we're really into. But the whole idea of whiskey highballs, you know, whiskey, soda water, cold, um, whether you do it with ice or the way Dave does it, this increasingly the Japanese style, where you put the whiskey in the freezer overnight, and you put the glass in the freezer, and your soda water's cold, and you bring them all together at a certain ratio. We're really into that, and especially in summer here in the Northern Hemisphere, and uh, drinking whiskey highballs in the early evening is, is something I love to do, and that's my favorite highball glass. Right. Peat Monster. Peat Monster. The first thing you'll notice is the color is much different from the others. All of these whiskeys are natural in color. All of these whiskeys are natural in color. We do not color our whiskeys. We do not chill filter our whiskeys. Most Scotch whiskeys, even most single malts, sadly to my mind, are colored and chill filtered, but colored with what's called spirit caramel. And I actually happen to have some right here. <laughs> we keep it in the blending room just to show people who visit what it is. We don't use it, but uh, this is kind of an old sample, but it kind of, it's kind of like a bit like, this is quite dried out, a bit like molasses, yeah? And it's a traditional thing, oddly enough. It's been done for, since you know, the 19th century, coloring whiskeys to make them look darker and therefore older. And we don't do it, because we think, I think whiskey is a natural product. Um, why would you mess around with a natural product? Um, and you know, a lot of people say, well, we, we add coloring just because consumers expect it. Whiskey drinkers expect whiskey to be dark. And they, they wouldn't, they'd be surprised if they saw some whiskeys at their natural color like that. I said, okay, well, let's just teach them what the natural color is. And they'll say, well, we add a little bit and it doesn't affect the flavor, but we know it does. We've done trials in here over the years. It does affect flavor. Sometimes it can actually enhance a whiskey that doesn't have much flavor. But we do not color our whiskeys. Everything is at their natural color. All the natural color in whiskey, as you may know, comes from the cask. When it comes off that still, that new make is clear as water. Yeah, it's more potent than water, but it's clear all comes from the cast, the natural color. So this is Peat Monster. The, the color in Spice Tree, that, f that new French oak, heavy toasted, gives tons of color. Story of the Spaniard, wine casks, sherry casks, red wine casks, there's also French oak in, gives tons of color and flavor, of course. Peat Monster, 99% of what's in here is aged in American oak casks that don't give as much color as those other types of casks, and that is natural. All right, smell. Peat, smoke. kind of um, um, a touch medicinal, um, a touch embery. Um, I want to point out that some of you will have in your, if you bought the sample packs, those three, the packs of three, the malt whiskey collection with the three 5CL 50 ml bottles, some of you out there are going to have our classic brown label, Pete Monster, and some of you are going to have the, what we, the new, what we call painting label, okay? This has been, a, what, a year now since we changed over the labels. And at the same time we changed to this label, we tweaked the recipe. We tweaked the recipe. And it's a story somewhat similar to the, the, the process we went through when we were making Story of the Spaniard. We spent months blind tasting, you know, the most popular heavy peated whiskeys made in Scotland, blind. No color, because some of them are, not, are, are artificially colored, so we don't want color to throw us off. We use these dark blue glasses over there so we can't see color. We didn't know what they were. We tasted everything blind and really tried to understand what is we like and why. And we put Peat Monster in there to understand. And what we found is that, and we also did, Jill conducted some tastings here in London with some whiskey clubs that really helped us out, really helped inform us to what people, what, how, ways that we could enhance and evolve slightly and tweak our recipe to make it even more compelling. And some people will say, oh, you know, I thought, you know, when whiskey blenders, they, one of the, the things they're proud of is that their blends never change. And I will tell you with c confidence that that is, that's a marketing line. That's a bunch of hooey. You know, recipes change. You know, recipes, blends change over the years. We've got lo beautiful bottles of famous brands from 50 years ago, um, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, and you taste them against what they make today, and they are different. And there's lots of reasons for that, and I'm not critical of that. I think that's just evolution, that's just natural. But also, we reserve the right to make our products better if we can. 
And so that's why we decided to tweak this recipe. Now, most people wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two batches. Um, maybe some folks like, who, are, who are interested in what we're doing and therefore w with us tonight, you guys could, could probably tell. But it is a subtle evolution. And it's this whole idea of, if you think, about the, the, the brown label was more sort of exuberant and more sort of um, elemental um, in its character. Whereas what we do now is slightly more elegant, slightly more refined, with a bit more fruitiness and, and, and a, a kind of creamy character that can come out, especially when you add water. It's got the same PD intensity, it's just a subtle evolution of what we're doing today. So that's the painting label, which is the more, slightly more elegant, the brown label, slightly more elemental, okay? But both, um, both very similar. Both based primarily on malt whiskies from the Lafroy distillery and the Kalila distillery. But what's special about Peat Monster to us, despite its name, what we're not trying to do here is make the peatiest whiskey in Scotland. We'll leave that to others. Because what we're trying to do here is make a heavy peated whiskey that is delicious, that is balanced, and that you can drink glass after glass of, if you so choose. And so it's this balance and heavy peat that is the, the idea behind the peat monster. Yeah. Let's give that a swirl and a sniff. And I'm going to add a little water and open it up. Let's see what happens to that. So we made this whiskey. I, I made this one originally um, many years ago. We originally made it for uh, a very famous whiskey-oriented shop, wine spirit shop in New York City called Park Avenue Liquor Shop. Goldstein's good friends of ours. And this is before we were exporting to the US. And uh, Jonathan Goldstein got in touch with me one day. And I knew of him because I used to live in New York City. And I used to shop there and buy my whiskey there. And he called me up after I'd started Compass Box and going a few years. He said, would you make us a whiskey? He said, we buy casks from distilleries all over the place. And we, we have them bottled for us and bring them back to New York and sell them. How about you make a, a, a recipe for us, a malt whiskey recipe, a blend of single malts, and we'll buy the whole batch. And back then, I was like, wow, OK, yeah. Uh, we'll do that. He wanted something peaty. I kept sending him these samples of various blends using heavy peated malt whiskies, Isla malt whiskies. And he kept you know, writing me back and saying, I want it peatier. I want it peatier. And finally, I sent him through something and I said, you know, this is about as peaty as we get, can get without just selling you a cask of malt whiskey from Lafroy or something. Um, and I said, I, th I think you'll like with this one. I wrote on the, on the bottle, I mean, the sample bottles, you know, like these. I wrote on, this one's a monster. And he liked it a lot. And he said, okay, great, let's do it. What do we call it? I said, well, maybe the name's on the label already, Monster. And we ended up calling it the Pete Monster. And that's how this started. It was, a, it was a, a bespoke whiskey for the Park Avenue liquor shop in New York. And it sold really fast. And people were, were kind of thought it was really interesting because back then, this is 2003, people didn't um, label whiskeys like this um, in Scotland anyway. And uh, it, it got people's attention. And, and what we do at the end of the day, and go ahead and swirl, and if you haven't tasted already, please do get in. Mm. We love drinking malt whiskey, drinking whiskey in general with cheese. That's the thing. You're each going to get an opportunity <clears throat> to get our yearbook. That will come in the email tomorrow. Mm. The peat, the ember, um, the finish is just echoing. But you get this, like, there's a subtle sweetness on the palate, a, a subtle sweetness that lingers, the, the residual sweetness on the palate. And that's driven in part by the fact that the recipe for this, and you can see all the recipes on the website. We are completely transparent about the recipes and always have been. But you'll see 1% of, 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 every peat, of, of the Peat Monster recipe is that. Malt whiskeys that we would age for spice tree and, 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 and finished in just 1%. And you might think that what doesn't sound like very much. How can that really have an impact? But it does. It just, it's hard to know, it, know it's there. Although in the years when we were, 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 were trialing, it and starting to do that, you know, we would taste it with and without. We, you, you could tell. It just adding that one percent to the heavy peated malt whiskeys just gives it this lovely underlying sweetness and almost creaminess that I'm sensing right now on the palate. Yeah. The yearbook. So you'll get the yearbook, <clears throat> and in it you'll see an article about whiskey and cheese, blue vein cheeses. I love with heavy peated whiskeys like that. You'll see. You'll read all about that when you get the yearbook. <clears throat> 
I was referring back here, these are our raw materials. Um, in fact, <laughs> as if on, on cue, this is um, peat monster battings back here. So each of these, um, each of these bottles represents a cask, a single cask. So this is a cask sample from a malt whiskey from the Kalila distillery um, at cask strength. These are our raw materials. That, we'll, we'll, we take the cask samples in here, which will be sent down to us from Scotland. And here is where we'll create prototypes. We'll blend together at a small scale, um, using some of the equipment over there that you can't see, um, you know, measuring cylinders. We'll create what we call prototypes of what will happen in Scotland when we actually bring all the casks together. And I think, yeah, here we go. Uh, there is Peat Monster V2 from uh, November of 2018. And that would have been, there's not much left in that, that would have been a vatting from ver all these casks together to understand what it was gonna, would be like. And sometimes we have to make tweaks. Sometimes we, we, have to, we get this and we taste it against our benchmark samples of these products and we realize, oh, it's not quite right. We need a little less of that, of that single malt, a little more of that single malt or whatever the case may be. This is how we work. And that is a big whiskey. It's a big whiskey. Whether you're tasting the, the classic brown label or the new painting label, that is a big, big whiskey. Um, yeah. Alex, questions? Yeah. So um, Jessica wants to know uh, what makes good peat and are there standards within the industry? And the actual questions about uh, if they do scientific analysis on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What makes good peat? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure I can answer what makes good peat. Um, the profile that peat, peat is, is dug out of the earth. It's, 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 it's compacted matter from centuries. Um, it's dug out of the earth, it's dried, and it's used to smoke the barley, um, to dry and, 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 and also smoke the barley that some, some single malts are made from. Not all, most distilleries don't use heavy peated, or peated barley, but. Um, it's traditional in Scotland. So that's what peat is. And you'll get a different kind of smoky profile from peat from different parts of Scotland. Yeah. So there's really no um, better or worse. There, 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 are, there are differences. Um, and we do, and people in the industry, we do measure peatiness. Um, we measure it through, um, you can measure it in, in the barley, the smoked barley, but we measure it in the liquid. So we will regularly send samples of our prototypes here um, for analysis uh, in, to, a, to a lab we work with, uh, Tatlock and Thompson in, in, in Scotland, to, um, to understand the, com the, the levels of the various components, compounds that is, that, that contribute to a, the, the peatiness. So, yeah. No one's asked about age yet. What other questions do we have, Alex? Um, well, I mean, in fairness, there are over 100 questions. Around 140 questions have been asked. So Ooh. we're trying to get to We've got the, work cut out for all us the this ones week. that we can. <laughs> um, all right, we'll do it. Marcus asks about the monster on the label. How was it created? All ah, right, so the monster on the label. So the monster on the label, a peat monster. This, I originally came across this in some old books uh, from illustrations from the 19th century. Um, we've got these books, they're here in the office. And I love this, I was particularly drawn to this when we were creating the monster label for, for Park Avenue Liquor Shop. Drawn to this image, it was by an artist, a French artist who went by the name of Granville, Granville. Um, and he was known for bizarre illustrations that suggested that he was um, um, perhaps um, a big drinker of, 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 of um, I don't know, a pastis or something back then, but um, this was very typical of the kind of work he did. And we loved it, so we used it for, uh, for the Peat Monster labels. And then, several years ago, we did an anniversary bottling of Peat Monster, and we commissioned an artist named Mark Burkhart, uh, who lives out in Austin, Texas. We commissioned him to do a special Peat Monster label for us. And his work is fascinating, and he was, just, he was right for this, he was perfect for this, because the kind of work he does um, draws on folk art and gothic myths and, and things like this. And it was just perfect. He's, he's, he's quite a well-known artist. He's done work for Rolling Stone and Time Magazine. And he did a Johnny Cash album cover years ago. Um, and this painting that this label is based on hangs here in the office. 
Um, we, he, we, yeah, so he did that for us, and we, and we then, and we loved it so much. We did it for an anniversary bottling, but we decided a couple of years ago, let's make it the, 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 the everyday the, the bottling of peat monster. Other questions? Uh, so quite a few people do want to know about the composition of the whiskies, so uh, yeah. which go into them, and ages, and that. Sure. Yeah. Composition and recipes. It is all on the website. It is all on the website. All the recipes, or almost all the recipes are there. And if there's one that's not there, just email us and we'll send it to you. Age. For the first 15 years of the business, we published not just the, 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 the distillery, the, for every recipe, the distillery makeup, uh, the proportions of each distillery we drew from, the cast types. We published the ages. And about three, four years ago, yeah, four, just over four years ago, um, we were reported to the Scotch Whiskey Association for doing so because there is this little known law. We knew about it, but we just, we, um, that says, in, in, it's an EU law that says spirits producers, if they want to talk about age, they can only talk about the youngest component in a blend. And what we've been doing is publishing a recipe showing you everything with proportions, pie charts showing you. So not, not, no, 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 nobody could possibly believe that we were trying to mislead people as to only talking about the older stuff, which is what people used to do in the old days. And we were reported for that. And the Scotch Whiskey Association, doing their job, came to us and said, you know, we're not the police, but we've got to tell you, you're not supposed to do that. And long story short, we, we made some efforts. We created a transparency campaign several years ago, which is now dormant, to try to get the industry to see the, the, the right in changing that law. Because consumers deserve to know everything. If you, the reason it was put into law years and years, decades ago, is comp some companies, spirits producers, scotch producers, would, would, would say something like, you know, this is made from, um, uh, there's, this is made from whiskeys as, as old as 60 years. When in fact what they would do is they'd take a whiskey that's much, much younger and just dollop it with a tiny little drop of, of six-year-old whiskey and say, hey, it's, you know, for marketing purposes, we can say it's got six-year-old whiskey. So they made this law to try to stop unscrupulous marketers from doing that. But it's kind of ham-handed if you think about it. And what it does is it precludes transparent producers like us from telling you everything in an unbiased and fair way. We did, had no luck uh, in getting them to change their minds. Brexit kicked in at that point, and that might have distracted them. Um, but it's, it, it's something that I do believe in and intend to bring back to the industry um, when the moment is right. So what we agreed w with our lawyers is, I guess you could call it a loophole. If you ask us the age of all the components in our recipes, we're permitted to tell you. We simply can't proactively um, tell you the age of all the components. We can only tell you the youngest. So, but if you ask us, we're permitted to tell you. So if you ever ask us, um, we will be happy to tell you the age of everything. Email us, ask us at a tasting. We're very open about that. Um, right, 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 right. How are we doing? Um, well, I would say, I think everyone would be very angry if I didn't ask the two most popular questions. Uh, okay. One is, where did the name Compass Box come from? And the other one is, what's your favorite whiskey? Today? <laughs> uh, where did the name Compass Box come from? came from a constellation. It came from a constellation. In my desk, in, in, in the, the, the other blending room around the hall, down the hall, I could show you this scrap of paper um, where I was writing lists, a list of different names to name my company many, 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago. And I came across the name, I wanted something that was totally different from everything else in Scotch Whiskey. And I came across, I love constellations. And I was, for a while, I was thinking, oh, it'll be, it'll be the Orion Whiskey Company. I love the constellation Orion, but my father, intelligently pointed out that the Orion Whiskey Company, John, he said, would sound like an Irish whiskey company, Orion. So I said, okay. <laughs> and there were some other constellation names I really liked. And there was one constellation called Pyxis, which was translated in this translation, kind of a translation, but that I'd read to the compass box. Most translations translated as the mariner's compass, but this one called it the compass box, the box in which a, a, ship, a ship's captain would have kept the compass in olden times. And I just loved it. I loved the sound of it. I loved the feel of it. It was distinctive, and I went with it. It was a constellation. What is my favorite whiskey? <laughs> That's a trick question, right? <laughs> I, you know, I don't have one single favorite whiskey. We've made over 100 whiskeys in 20 years. Uh, over 100 whiskeys. Many of, you know, most of those limited editions. And I will 
you know, come back to them all from time to time, I mean, if I, if I have access to them. Because for me, you know, whiskey, whiskey is a journey, and it's, it's a, it sounds like a cliche, but it's a journey of exploration. Scotch whiskey has so much, there's more breadth of style across all those hundred odd distilleries making whiskey in Scotland today than any other spirit type in the world. I find that fascinating. I know many of you do too, and, and some of you who don't today will tomorrow. Yeah. So I don't really have a favorite. Um, yeah. But I, yeah, yeah. I see the time, and we should probably think about wrapping. I want to take you on a tour, a quick tour, down to the other end of the office. But before I do, um, there's a couple things I want to talk about. Um, what are we doing now with the business? Where, what, what, what's, what's new and what's coming? This is something we're very excited about. That is called Rogue's Banquet. That is a limited edition um, that is meant to, well, among other things, commemorate our 20th anniversary. We, there'll be two limited editions this year which, which directly commemorate our 20th anniversary and speak to it you know, in, 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 on the package. And this is one of them. Um, we, we launched this already. We launched this in March, um, and if you think back to what was going on in March, it wasn't the, most, the greatest time to launch a limited edition um, of fancy whiskey like this. Um, you'll sp what we've done is created a label that draws on some of the illustrations from Compass Box labels over the years. Um, a delicious old, it's actually a blended Scotch whiskey, but you would never know it. It's blended Scotch whiskey because it's got grain whiskey, but the grain whiskey is 25 years old. Wait. Sorry, I wasn't supposed to tell you that because there's a tiny little bit of 19-year-old Glenelgan malt whiskey from the Glenelgan distillery in this. But 90, over 95% of the rest is that age that I just told you. But somebody asked that question, didn't they? What was the age of Rogue's Mango? No, I believe so, thank yeah. You. That's yeah thank you. Right. Just answering the question. Delicious, lovely, old malt whis uh, blended Scotch whiskey. Um, that is coming down the pike. Or that, that's here. Um, as I said, we didn't make a big, big deal about it because it just didn't feel right back in March. But um, you'll hear us talking more and more about it as months go by. And in September, the second whiskey to commemorate our, limited, uh, our 20th anniversary will come out. It is all going to be called Hedonism Felicitas. Felicitas. I think we've got a picture of that that we can show folks. That is it. So it is a, a, a commemorative uh, Hedonism whiskey. Hedonism being the whiskey that started the company. I thought at the 10-year anniversary, and certainly at the 20-year anniversary, we need to do a special bottling of Hedonism. The, uh, the age profile of this is significantly older than our classic bottling. Um, felicitas is this word that I love. I love the sound of it. Alex, you've got this great definition. What does felicitas mean? Uh, yeah, I've got it written down here. Um, a condition of divinely inspired productivity, blessedness, or happiness. A condition of divinely inspired productivity, blessedness or happiness. Says it all, huh? Right, okay. One other thing we're doing now I wanna make mention of is our fundraiser. Uh, for the last uh, two months or so, maybe just about two months, we've been um, running a fundraiser to help people in the hospital, to help charities that support people in the hospitality business who've lost work um, and, and, are, and, and lost income. We've, um, we're supporting charities in both the United States and here in Europe and the UK. Um, and tomorrow in the email we send you, that there'll be a link to, to the, the sites here. You can purchase this cool um, stuff that, and all the proceeds all of the, from this go to charities to support the hospitality industry, folks in the hospitality industry. Kindness, community, creativity. I was wearing one this morning as I was walking along my dog along the river. People stop, they look at it, you can see they're, they're, they're interested in it. People can, you know, guy gave me a thumbs up. Right. Okay. Time for a little tour. Okay. A little tour. Um, okay. Good. Right. Um, as I head to the front, um, uh, just tomorrow on this email you're going to get, um, you're going to get a, um, a, a, an email address in this email that'll be for, for questions, <laughs> the many 140 odd questions or so that did not get answered. You'll get, you'll get an email address. It's hello at compassboxwhiskey.com. You can send your questions today if you want. Um, you'll also get a link to our fundraiser site. Um, you will get an opportunity in this email that will give you the opportunity to have us send you old fashioned snail mail, a copy of our yearbook, um, which I was talking about earlier. So you can get one of those, hard copy. Um, and also, a special little gift will, for you um, will, will be in that, uh, that email tomorrow as well. This is our whiskey library. 
It doesn't have everything um, that we've ever made. It's got most of what we've made. Um, and when people come to visit us here, they love, they stand here for, uh, they stand here for a long time and just kind of check it all out and admire what we've got. This is mostly, this is almost all the limited editions we've ever done, the core products as well. Um, yeah, this is our library. I wanted to show, share that with you because it's, it kind of gives you in one shot kind of what we've, the, the record we've, we've created over the last 20 years. No name too. Right. It's time to say goodnight. I've really enjoyed this. This has been really cool, I think. 500 people, 30 different countries. I want to say thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, I want to do this again, and I hope you'll join me. Um, we appreciate um, your interest and your support of what we do. We thank you. And thanks for joining us. And I just want to leave, uh, I, I'm nothing left to say at this point, except uh, it's, uh, it's evening here in London, wherever you are around the world. I hope you have a good day, a good evening. Thanks for joining us very much. Cheers.